Yo, 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 what is going on, ROK Familia? It is your boy BN, aka Mr. Kingdom Builder, and today we are back again giving you some more of this good, good, in the hood, quality information and education. Today, we are going to be touching on being a diplomat, essentially doing diplomacy from the position of your alliance. Now, more often than not, you're probably an officer and you get a role kind of assigned to you or tagged on. And one of those can be a diplomat. And so we're going to touch on everything that you can really do as a diplomat. We will focus predominantly on home kingdom, but we will touch a little bit on KVK diplomacy towards the end of the video. That will probably just be a separate one because there actually is a lot that goes into that. But before we do get started, as always, make sure you guys sub, like, ring the notification bell. And of course, if you want to join and be a part of our conversation, you can find a link to our Discord in the pinned comment in the description down below. Okay. So first things first, uh, some of the big differences between kind of home diplomacy or home kingdom diplomacy versus KVK is that when you're in home kingdom diplomacy, very similar to kind of recruiting in some respects as well, you will be predominantly focusing on all the alliances that are in your zone one province, right? So we're talking just when you're starting out. Now, when you expand and you get a little deeper into the kingdom, that will eventually transition to uh, provinces that you're adjacent to, right? That you might be meeting in zone two. Same thing with once you eventually get to zone three. And then probably later at a certain time, will be when you end up coming across like the adjacent zone ones, right? And not necessarily in any particular order, but that's kind of the general recommendation, recommended path, right, that you would follow. You would really be focusing on, I mean, the example here is that if I'm over here in Rivendell, right, I probably wouldn't really need to focus on diplomacy on the opposite side of the map if we're starting off in zone one in Umbar. Now, it doesn't mean that it wouldn't be a bad idea, Right, to reach out to other alliances, even if they are, are in other Zone 1 starting provinces. However, focusing on these ones first and the alliances that are there is the most important part. When you look at something like KVK diplomacy, a lot of what you're focusing on is more or less a single point of contact between, which is usually, you know, whoever the KVK diplo lead is for the kingdoms, right? So you might only ever reach out or speak to seven other people, but in your zone one starting province, you might speak to double that, right? Depending on how many alliances start up and then more once you start getting into the adjacent zone one provinces and eventually zone two. Now, from here, the second thing is that recognizing as a diplomat, you are pretty much for all intents and purposes, a problem solver. You are a closer. You are someone that I would say probably would have good, some good people skills, right? Good talking skills. Um, I would say good negotiation skills. Um, and we'll get into a few of the other, I think, likely characteristics and kind of tell you how I think those impact. But for the most part, think of yourself like George Clooney in that movie Up in the Air that he plays with Anna Kendrick, right? Where he basically travels across the country and goes to a bunch of different company branch offices. He's letting people go from their job. And he has to basically adapt and react to each individual based on how they react to being let go. To basically keep the mood as neutral and kind of calm to where it at least gives the impression that they, they are amicably uh, leaving, right, uh, in, in that regard. Uh, even though, you know, for most of us, or at least if you've seen the movie, you know that, you know, again, kind of getting let go when you've been somewhere for a very long time. Uh, right, is uh, sometimes um, anything but. Uh, and so part of that, I think, is really important when it comes to how you approach doing diplomacy and kind of your tone and how you go about talking to people. Then we get to the introduction and kind of relationship building part. This is number three. Now, f before you even get to the introduction, building good relationships is extremely important. Because when you're in a home kingdom, the Pope really is that you are going to be playing here, wherever that may be, for a long time, right? I don't think anyone goes into a kingdom 
and especially if you're you know whether you're doing it solo you're migrating or if you're a part of a, a jump group where you where you think to yourself hey i'm gonna go here but i'm just gonna play here for a week and then i'm gonna dip no you're you're going somewhere or you're landing somewhere because you're hoping this is going to be your new home and so i think you know when you when you look at it from that perspective you're going to be seeing probably a lot of these people more often than not and so building good relationships can not only help lay good foundation but if you invest into those relationships they may pay dividends and they may work out for you in possibly the least or the most unexpected ways right or times and so then we get to the introduction portion or the part here which is that it's really good to reach out to these people and just introduce yourself right you a good example here is let's say where, where am i i'm right here Right. Okay. So let's say I go to, I don't even know whoever this yellow, whoever yellow is here. Right. Let's just give you an example. So I would go here I'd click on the Alliance. I would find out who the leader is and right. So I'd go here, I'd click, I go info and then I go chat. And when I click chat, right, it'll bring this up and whatever this loads, did it load? Cool. So I might say, I might say something simple here, such as, uh, hi, smart, right? Uh, I'll just say for keeping it relevant, I'm PN, right? Leader of, uh, we'll just say TOS, um, in the same province, wanted to reach out, uh, to you and introduce myself. Uh, yeah, and I mean, again, this is where you can kind of get into the part where you might say something like, you know, this is my alliance, right? Or, or you know, we just started in this kingdom or, you know, we're a jump group and we've we've come in. Um, you know, you can say something like, uh, what would I say, wanted to reach out and introduce myself. Uh, we are hoping to, uh, split, you know, split the province with other, um, you know, with other uh, strong alliances. Um, alliances, eh, maybe you wouldn't say split because that might already give the impression that you are acting from an authoritative position. Uh, so you might say, uh, we are hoping to work with, there we go, hoping to work with other alliances um, in the province uh, that seem uh, to be, uh, or yeah, I guess you could just say other alliances in the province, <laughs> right? Bam, and then you can say, um, uh, right? Did you know? You could ask something like, you know, did your, um, uh, did you, did you just start in this kingdom from day one? Or are you a jumper, right? Something like that. Um, and again, this just kind of gives you an example of something that, that you may say, um, right? And, and again, you can word it differently, how, however you'd like. This is just, again, kind of a brief template example. But this is kind of the process you would go through, right? You'd find the alliances, you'd go out, you reach out. You can even have a template introduction, right? Where you just say, hi, hi nice to meet you. I'm the leader of this alliance. Um, I just wanted to reach out um, so we can be in contact, right? I, you know, I, I do diplomacy for my alliance. I don't know if you do diplomacy or someone else does, right? Who would be the best person to speak to, right? That's kind of how you would go about doing your introduction portion. Then, let me see here. We get to my next one, which is point number four. On, right, reaching, even though I kind of briefly just talked about this, but essentially reaching out to all the leaders in the alliances in your province, right? You would do this process and kind of go through all of them. I guess that is a quick one. And then we kind of get into number five, which that was super short, is that you would then want to kind of transition that. So after you make the introduction, you kind of figure out where you're going, right? That kind of gets you your starting point. Then eventually you'll do the same thing when you end up going into zone two like we said earlier if you end up noticing that you have your adjacent provinces you might reach out to them too as well once you kind of get to that week to week mark before zone two opens or the pass is open for you to attack and then uh, if there's anyone else that might pop into zone two right but for the most part you'd be looking at your adjacents 
or at least the adjacents that can go into the same zone two province, right? And so just because you have a, a zone one province to your left or right, it doesn't necessarily mean that they will be the ones that are going to go into zone two, right? The important part is looking at the ones that have pass access to zone two, and then which ones have their territory connected to the passes, where it give you the it'll give you the indication that they are probably going to be going into your zone two as well. Uh, and then, uh, so I think that's number five. So number six here <clears throat> is that I think it's really important to be able to assess accurately, right? Assessing strength, assessing, uh, not even just strength, but danger, if you will, right? Just being able to assess the alliances that you're speaking to. And that can be anything from assessing, you know, how fast did they get their center fortress down? Um, how many flags do they currently have compared to yours? What's their alliance power on the leaderboards compared to yours? Right? How many top players do they have in their alliance? Um, have any of them shown any aggression, right? Or kind of doing any kind of lawless or kind of rogue PvP? Uh, right? These are some indicators that you can use to gauge where the other alliances are in comparison to your alliance. Right, as an individual, or maybe your group's alliances, or your group of alliances. And so it's, it's really important to kind of know this information, and then also at the same time being able to kind of figure out, uh, and this kind of gets into the next thing, right, which is, I think, really important, probably the second part to this, right, this is number seven, which is figuring out their wants and their needs, right, probing is what we like to call it. And so you, you start kind of probing for information, where you know you're trying to kind of get more ideally than than you give uh, and not to be in kind of a malicious way but you know sometimes you just kind of want to get a feel for you know where where is that other alliance and what do they actually want versus you know what do they possibly just need and so being able to kind of assess you know strength and even if it's combat capabilities right where you kind of go into and I think an example, and I'll give you an example here, right? So let's say, let me just zoom out real quick. So an example here would be, let's just go down to this province. Let's say that this alliance here, 606, this is probably a good example, right? So you can see LG8 has a lot of territory, right? Probably a stronger alliance than 606. So let's say 606 starts off, right? They cap two, three objectives. LG8 has double their flags, uh, double their power, right? And let's say there's a couple other alliances in the area. There's like one or two other alliances that are around LG8's power. Well, it's somewhat unrealistic for 606 to demand a pass going in to zone two, right? Where it's like, that's just a dedicated pass. Like they're just like, oh, I, we want this pass. If you don't give us this pass, right, we're going to fight or we're going to cause you problems or whatever it may be, right? Like that, that is somewhat unrealistic. And, and I'm, I'm just using this again in this example, because this often happens in kingdoms where you'll have lower powered alliances that ask for territory, the last for objectives, the last for passes. And more often than not, the alliance is just so low on power that you know and, and sure they might have some territory they might have a couple objectives but it just doesn't really make sense to um, give up dedicated objectives that are moving that are progressing right able to kind of push you farther into the kingdom where they're just dedicated to these smaller alliances right you can make the argument of you know maybe doing something where you like pass swap or something right for uh for uh players to get in or kind of advance into other zones right if they just want to gather um, in those but outside of that right again it doesn't really make a lot of sense in this kind of a scenario and this this does happen so it's important to be able to kind of navigate that as a diplomat and figure out how you would word that best right how would you kind of de-escalate the situation i think is another good way of approaching it um, and then the next thing that we get into here, I think this is, what am I at? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I'm at eight. So eight here would be, you know, again, realizing that you might have to try and do things when it comes to a kind of assessing threats on avoiding war. Maybe you might have to go to war sometimes. Doing things like land disputes, um, objective disputes, um, trying to allocate territory and distribute. Uh, that could also apply to objectives, whether that be passes, sanctum altars, shrines, and realizing how that affects the 
province as a whole, and then the other provinces, how it may affect zone two in the future, right? Having a little bit of foresight here as a diplomat can be really important because zone one is, is essentially the, for the most part, it really is the most important part of, of a kingdom's development um, is zone one by far. And zone one usually, depending on how zone one plays out going into zone two for all six of the provinces, can either severely impact or minimally impact your kingdom's activity level and player retention as a whole and really kind of set the pace and the tone for it. Uh, then we get into the next point, which I think is number nine now, right? Kind of having leverage versus not having leverage. Um, so this is really important. Um, kind of goes back to what, the example I gave here of the two alliances, right? Where sometimes having leverage can mean that your alliance is stronger than another. You have more active players than another. Maybe you have more advanced tech. Uh, maybe you uh, have double their flags. Maybe you have more objectives, so you're already kind of getting more passive bonuses. And, you know, maybe, maybe you're just more organized than another alliance. And so sometimes having leverage and knowing how and kind of when to use that leverage right in a smart way uh, and usually i kind of like to ref i like to steer away from flaunting if you will but i do think that it's important to recognize when you have leverage and when you're kind of speaking from a position of i don't want to say power because i feel like that is a little too aggressive but when, when you're speaking from, from a more favorable position we'll go with that than another diplomat right for another alliance that in and of itself is important to recognize because it also can afford you and allot you um, certain openings when it comes to how you speak and the tone you set and how you talk to other alliances as well and then we got two more here which i think this brings me to number 10 if that's correct let me see five six seven eight nine okay i'm on ten so ten would be uh, I think compromising is really important at times, and of course when needed. Recognizing that you may not always get what you want, but you might have to settle for just what you need. <clears throat> and so, you know, it, it's important, like I said, and almost everything is important, but it is important to recognize, you know, what what your own personal wants and needs are. So that way you can set appropriate expectations when you are doing diplomacy in your home kingdom, right? An example of this is if you're a strong alliance, you may not need every single zone two pass or zone one pass going into zone two. You might only need one, right? Even though you may want more, you may only need one or two, um, depending on how that province is playing out. And uh, sometimes it can, it can really come down to, well, if you want everything, then that kind of comes with its own sacrifices, right? There's, there's a give and take here, right? So if you, if you take, then you could be giving up uh, active players and active alliances that may decide whether or not to continue on in the kingdom you're in or not. Um, and that can have later effects that you probably won't see until you eventually get to zone two, uh, start, and then eventually once you get to zone three and kind of how KVK may play out. Um, depending on how many engaging and active alliances you have. So again, recognizing that compromising at times can be really important and actually can be a great thing that you can almost view as an investment to get better ROI down the line. Uh, and then the last thing here is, well, I guess it kind of covers it. The last point, what really was kind of just being able to um, have some foresight on the outcome of something and really understand that, you know, how you conduct diplomacy is playing into not only how your alliance can work its way, because for the most part, almost every alliance is trying to, you know, wants to keep advancing in the kingdom, right? Everyone wants to try and make it into zone three, zone two, right? These are just kind of commonalities, right? Common denominators that we're going to see for pretty much every active alliance. Nobody wants to, for the most part, just kind of get stuck and stay in zone one. And so recognizing... You know, ha uh, not recognizing having the foresight to see an outcome and how you can get there and how you need to plan ahead in your preparation in order to fulfill and accomplish that 
is needed, right? That is important in and of itself to think about what are the steps you have to take to get here, right? If something goes this way, this is how we can react, right? Kind of like doing the Bobby Fischer, the Magnus Carlson, depending on your favorite player, and kind of thinking 10, 20, 30 moves ahead. Um, having contingencies, backups as well, right? When it comes to trying to get to this outcome. So again, that's really important. Um, and for the most part, um, that pretty much, I think, covers everything here on diplomacy What for kind of how you'd be starting off in a home kingdom. Uh, the, I know I did say I was going to kind of give a little special thing here at the end, and I will, uh, which comes to kind of the KVK portion. So I will just kind of give a very brief example here, um, or I guess some information. But when you're doing KVK diplomacy, some of the best tips I can really give you uh, before I eventually do kind of a later video where I break it down more is reach out to kingdoms early and keep reaching out to them so you can have a point of contact for the kingdom prior to your kvks coming up now obviously you can do you can do this a lot more in kvk1 right because you kind of know the kingdoms that are going to be there based on the ones that are in your continent right or in your eight region uh, your eight kingdom region but that's a great tip, is, is try to reach out to them as early as possible. Sometimes doing this once you get into, once you start seeing kingdoms get into zone two is a little better because usually after the kingdom has been going for a little while, um, you can kind of start seeing who's settling in places to, to a soft degree. So sometimes just reaching out as early as possible and having points of contact, reaching out again once they get to zone three, closer once they get to KVK as well. Um, and, and this is mainly so you can try to identify who is the point person there to speak to? And sometimes in some kingdoms, it may take longer to find. You might be able to find it earlier in other kingdoms. So um, that is my best tip really going into your KVK1 is do not take that for granted. Reach out to people early and try just to, again, introduce, build relationships, you know, share information here and there and you know, try to assess how, you know, uh, another kingdom's strength and kind of what they have to offer versus yours. And sometimes just by developing the relationship early, it doesn't come across as you doing it last minute before KVK comes up and you kind of having this like needy union allyship feel when you reach out to someone last minute, right? So doing it early gives a better impression because it doesn't come off as now you just need something. So that would be probably my best tip going into KVK1. That is it for me. I hope you guys enjoyed this video where we go over and touch on kind of the diplomacy role that a member of an alliance or an officer of an alliance um, would play and all the different things to think about, to consider, giving you some examples on how you can go about conducting your own diplomacy. And if anything, I hope that this just provides a good template for and a good checklist or to-do list on what are a lot of the common things you're going to come across as a diplomat and how you as, a, as an individual who maybe is a diplomat or conducting diplomacy for your alliance and or even your kingdom to a, to a smaller degree based on just the premise of this video focusing on what you know your alliance in the home kingdom may help you as well of course as always i'd love to know what you guys think about this video uh, the content the items that we did cover in it um, and again, any other shared thoughts, right? Have, have you applied some of these things for yourself as a diplomat? Um, watching me talk about and go over some of these things, did it kind of give you some ideas? Did it give you some now new things that you can do and apply to your own uh, diplomacy conduct that you do for yourself uh, and or your alliance or kingdom? Let me know anything and everything in the comments down below. Uh, that is it for me. Uh, until next time, as always, we'll catch you later.